today on the Burning Archive, we are talking about Russian history. There have been so many dark, tragic events in Russian history. There have been so many tyrannical, dictatorial figures. Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, the Great Famine, the Great Terror, the Revolution, the catastrophic tragedies of World War II. Is it surprising that there should be a black legend of Russian history? But like all legends, they conceal more than they reveal. And unless we get beyond the black legend of Russian history, we will not be able to see the real Russia. What is the black legend of Russian history? That is the question on today's Burning Archive. Most images of Russian history and culture presented in the Western media are remorselessly negative. By Western media, I mean like news and documentaries, movies, newspapers, internet stories, I guess, as well. And this negative image of Russian history and culture has clearly reached a sort of apex in the last six months or so in the context of rhetoric around the war in Ukraine. But it has been much longer lasting than that and has some very deep roots, not just in propaganda or media uh, misunderstandings, but really in, to some degree, the historical by non-Russians and even to some degree by Russians themselves uh, about their past. There is, if you like, a black legend of Russian history and that is what we're going to be talking about today. That black legend surfaces every time you see an image of Vladimir Putin presented as some steely-eyed ex-KGB agent evil mastermind or uh, when you see uh, representations of Russians as you know brutes who are accustomed to authoritarian uh, oppression and in some rhetoric almost not civilized at all. And there is, of course, some truth to some of these negative images. There's been a lot of terrible things that have happened in, in Russian history. The hundred years, if you like, roughly a hundred years, the, or the years from 1914 to uh, 1991 uh, were deeply tragic. And then the years in the 1990s were even more tragic again. There's been periods of repression, there's been invasions, there's been extremely colourful rulers, often of a very dictatorial and authoritarian kind. But the stories are a lot more complicated than you would uh, imagine from watching shows like the, the Endless Stories on the Romanovs or Rasputin, making equivalences between Stalin or Lenin and Vladimir Putin. So what happens in the Black Legend is that some of those negative features of Russian history become the sole focus in the sole explanation for what is going on and that has a lot of negative effects basically is a huge barrier to understanding and negotiation with another culture both in a political sense but also in a cross-cultural cross-cultural sort of understanding sense the idea of a black legend of course is not only something that uh, happened has happened in Russian history. It is something that's happened in a number of cases, either a black legend or a special path. There's a, germ, a special uh, German word, which is something like Unterzweig or something like that, Unterzweig or something, um, that refers to the special path of German history in the 20th century, for example. And in my episode on the Spanish Empire, back in, in my episodes on the Spanish Empire, episodes 38 and 39, back in mid-February 
2022, just a week or so before the Russian invasion of Ukraine and uh, the whole schedule of the Burning Archive. Our podcast was a little bit thrown out. Um, uh, that uh, that um, that episode referred to the black legend of Spanish history. Um, the you know how was it that uh, the Spanish Empire, which ruled an empire on which the sun never set, that controlled the silver and the gold of the Americas and uh, the Philippines and and a large part of Europe, how did that uh, Spanish Empire end up so weak, at least by the 19th and 20th centuries? And the idea that some people develop was that it was due to some sort of moral corruption in the Spanish soul, or if not in their soul, then certainly in the elite soul. That that corruption that led to the Spanish Inquisition and and all sorts of uh, deformities amongst its leaders and to the uh, inhumanity and cruelty of its empire. Allegedly unique cruelty and inhumanity. And as we learnt in that episode, uh, or those episodes, 38 and 39, that black legend is not really the case in uh, the Spain's case, and equally it is not the case in Russia's case. That kind of thinking about Spain was to some degree seeded and developed by, uh, was a case of history being invented by the winners, in this case by the English, uh, so often recounting the story of defeating the Spanish Armada and seizing the Spanish galleons in their plucky pirate ships and so on and so forth. But it is a oversimplification of one dominant factor that turns history from a really complicated story and an intriguing story into a, a tragic fate and a piece of propaganda for the winners. In the Russian case, the black legend is the result of decades, if not centuries, of hostility from Western Europe, and in particular from the uh, Anglo-Americans. There is a quite heavy, if you like, Orientalist strain to this kind of thinking. It's the view of Catholic or Protestant Europe looking down on Orthodox Eastern Europe, and there are even some racist stereotypes that underlie some of the worst cases of the black legend, some of the worst cases of the Russian Russian phobia or Russian hatred, and perhaps, of course, the worst case of all of some of that Russian hatred was one Adolf Hitler who who waged a war of extermination against Eastern Europe. But yes, it does have very long roots. And if I just quote for example from, uh, and it has its roots, I guess, in the sense of superiority of Western Atlantic Anglo-American civilization, an assumption that uh, as the historian Christopher Lash wrote that people in the West took it as a matter of course that they lived in a civilization surpassing any which history had been able to record. They assumed that their own particular customs, institutions and ideas had universal validity, that having showered their blessings upon the countries of Western Europe and North America, those institutions were destined to be carried to the furthest reaches of the earth and bring light to those living in darkness. A story we still hear in the liberal rules-based uh, or international order. And this was a description by Christopher Lash of the attitudes of American liberals towards the Russian Revolution. It reflected a sense that Russians, and here I quote from uh, Ronald Grigor Suni's introductory essay to the Cambridge History of Russia, 
volume three of the 20th century, which is a sort of overview of the reading of Russia and the Soviet Union in the 20th century, largely by Anglo-American historians, or when I say Anglo-American historians, I mean uh, historians based in America. Uh, within that universe of ideas, Russians were constructed as people fundamentally different from Westerners, with deep, largely immutable national characteristics, ideas of a Russian soul or an essentially spiritual or collectivist nature guided the interpretations and policy prescriptions of foreign observers. And he traces that back to the account of a uh, Central European traveller slash diplomat uh, of the 16th century, I think. Yes, the here we are. The from his um, uh, Sigismund von Herberstein, who wrote in Notes Upon Russia, how the people enjoy slavery more than freedom, and this story seemed to appear frequently. It appears even in the accounts of Antonio Posavino, who was a diplomat who travelled to Moscow in the 1570s in order to negotiate on the part on the part of the Pope the concession of the Orthodox faith to rejoin the uh, one true faith of Western Europe. It's a story that appeared in the travels of Monsieur de Custine, or Marquis de Custine, who, who was a French traveller of the early 19th century, who, who produced uh, an account of Russia that was full of distaste and hatred, and um, uh, described a, a country full of, I guess, stupid, coarse peasants and decadent, drunken, drunken uh, aristocrats. It's a story, it's a, it's a uh, legend that appears in the Disney movie Anastasia, with, which of course is the account of, um, of the, uh, the, you know, legendarily surviving daughter of the last Tsar. And in that film, Rasputin is presented as almost literally a devilish monster. And he represents, I guess, the darkness of the Russian soul. But there are uh, alternative black legends as well, such as that by the Russian writer Dmitry Galkovsky, who says that, in fact, from 1917, England... Um, uh, uh, operated a puppet regime in Russia that in fact Russia was a crypto col colony of the English and that Stalin, Lenin, even Putin perhaps were actually controlled by the shadowy figures of English finance and espionage. So black legends can have multiple forms, but in particular with Russian history, and this perhaps is, um, well, it's still evident today, but it's something that I certainly recall from, from my early, my days at university when, of course, the Soviet Union was still in existence. The history of Russia, or the historiography of Russia in the 20th century, has been very much dominated by Cold War American scholarship, which in turn has been heavily influenced by uh, security interests, grievances of emigre nationalities in America, and the ideological competition between socialism and capitalism. And a whole series of influential figures have um, have come from that world of Cold War American scholarship. Richard Pipes, Zbigniew Borinsky, in a way, uh, also Stephen Kotkin and Sergei Plokhi, who are among the more prominent American uh, scholars of Russia and Eastern Europe at the moment. Sergei Plokhi, in particularly Plokhi, um, in particular is the most prominent sort of 
a Ukrainian American historian of Ukraine. And as Ronald Grigor Suni says at the outset of this Cambridge history of Russia, from its very beginnings, the historiography of Russia in the 20th century has been much more than an object of coolly detached scholarly contemplation. Many observers saw the USSR as the major enemy of Western civilization, the principal threat to the stability of nations and empires, a scourge that sought to fun- undermine the fundamental values of decent human societies. And one of the reasons that the Cold War American scholarship was dominated by this kind of worldview was that within the Soviet Union itself, I mean, history history was a was uh, within Marxism uh, seen as a science of class relationships and societies, and so it was heavily dominated by. I guess an ideological viewpoint uh, and the, the the needs of the state, so that um, there was, I guess, a certain school of Russian history that celebrated the revolution and um, reinterpreted uh, past Russian history as uh, the story of class struggle and all that sort of thing. And against that, there was the sort of American school of Russian history, which saw the revolution as a tragic mistake, as a, as, as, um, and developed the sort of story of authoritarianism. And in particular, this idea of authoritarianism in the post-World War II era came to have a big, big influence how Russian history was told in the West. Um, there was the, uh, I guess, the moral equivalence drawn between Stalin and Hitler and the representation of the Soviet system as totalitarian. And it's a discussion for another day, the ways in which that is both true and not true, but we'll sort of leave that aside. But I think you can just hear in the way in which uh, Sunni describes how Cold War American scholarship of the Soviet Union represented Russia is not so different to the post-Cold War uh, American scholarship's representation. You can hear in what Sunni says about Cold War American scholarship of the Soviet Union that it presents very similar themes to the way in which post-Cold War American scholarship presents the themes of Russia and Russian history. Uh, Putin is the new Stalin. The FSB is the new KGB and so on and so forth. But on the Burning Archive, we don't believe in trading in uh, old Cold War uh, rhetoric about uh, anything. But um, And I think perhaps one of the best ways of uh, overcoming this misconception about Russia, and I think it's important to overcome it because I think these delusions about Russia have led uh, the Western nations into a series of catastrophic uh, errors in the last uh, few months in which we're all going to be suffering for uh, but uh, one of the best ways to overcome it is through a book called the russia anxiety and how history can resolve it by uh, mark b smith who is a professor at a uh, english university oh he's he teaches in the faculty of history at the university of cambridge and he has written this marvelous book called the russia anxiety in which he sets out in a lot more detail than i have the sort of what he describes as the bare phantasmagoria the sort of uh, presentation of uh, russia as this inherently threatening evil um, state and he argues that there's, there's something a bit like Orientalism, the idea of the West turning the East into this sort of both uh, intriguing but also threatening kind of or diminished sort of uh, other. Uh, there's something similar to that that applies with Russia. 
uh, and he describes it as the rush of anxiety, which is a cycle of fear, contempt and disregard for Russia over time. That at different times there's fear, at different times there's contempt, gas station pretend masquerading as a country, fear today and through the 90s, complete disregard. And he writes the historical stories that give the Russia anxiety life come from the black legend. These stories provide historical fuel for the cycle of fear, contempt and disregard that alternate within the syndrome of the Russia anxiety. The black legend of Russian history assumes a barely deviating, even inevitable route to misfortune for the Russian people, connecting past to present and future in an unbreakable structure. So it's that black legend that I'm going to focus on today. And in fact, what I'm going to do is sort of read from uh, Mark's book where he, he, or Professor Smith's book, where he, he sets out the black legend in some detail. So I'm going to read this approximately two page section of Mark B. Smith's The Russia Anxiety uh, about the black legend of Russian history. And I'll just add in a few little clarifying notes as I go along. Russia's black legend, by contrast, does not do this. It's certainly clever. Many of its details are accurate, but ultimately it's based on a blunt understanding of historical change. It pulls off a brilliant rhetorical trick, but its overall argument is misleading. Here it goes. Geography is the black legend's starting point. The harsh climate of the central Eurasian landmass with its long freezing winters means that the Russian lands have always had a short growing season, sometimes half the length of Western Europe's. Fields can be rotated less frequently, diminishing their fertility. But Russia is unlucky too in its rainfall. It rains the most where the soil is worst. The good quality black earth soil can't yield its potential. Harvests, as a consequence, are low. Unable to scratch much more than a subsistence living, peasants were averse to risk. They spent the long winters cooped up with their animals, breathing in too much carbon monoxide from the stoves in their wooden houses. As a result, they became passive, failing to develop and innovate. They were almost congenitally backward. I should add, of course, Mark B. Smith is speaking in the voice of the perpetrators of the Russian legend there. Uh, peasants relied on each other through bonds of mutual responsibility, and while their collective identity was strong, they had little sense of individual personhood. Also, the legend claims. Nevertheless, some of them had enough initiative to seek out the open route to a better life in the south and east. In order to maintain production levels, extract taxes and recruit enough soldiers, the sovereign found such mobility intolerable. Peasants had to be prevented from moving on. They had to be tied to the land. This was the basis of serfdom. And of course, serfdom has some similarities to slavery. With or without serfdom, serfdom, the very small agricultural surpluses inhibited urban growth. Production of finished goods was low and the country relied excessively on raw materials and natural resources. In the first instance, fur. The problem of weak urban development was worsened by geographical isolation, insufficient waterways and poor roads, all of which suffered when the snow and ice melted in the spring. Poor communication links reduced access to trade. And I might just add there that in a way this particular aspect of the legend is repeated today in the idea that Russia is a gas station pretending to be a country. I think they were the words of former Senator John McCain from America and 
that misunderstanding has led to some of the miscalculations in recent times. Uh, so continuing with Mark B. Smith, Towns lacked an independent spirit. By international standards, there wasn't much of a bourgeoisie. A class which owned capital, drove forward trade, turned professional gain qualifications and administered public offices effectively. The nobility was also weak because property law was tilted dramatically in favour of the sovereign. In fact, law was a misnomer as the sovereign's authority was unlimited. He owned everything inside his realm and his subjects were de facto and sometimes de jure slaves. Officials who administered central government and the provinces quickly resorted to corruption. The term to describe this system is patrimonialism. Over several centuries, the black legend goes on, the system of Russian oppression was extended in all directions as Muscovy and then the Russian Empire grew at an extraordinary speed. Eventually, the empire reached the Pacific Ocean. In this system of power, ethnic Russians were colonised, exploited, as much as other ethnicities. Meanwhile, the long borders that resulted were difficult to defend, generating all kinds of geopolitical challenges. The eastern, southern and western borderlands were all zones of suspicion and threat. Foreigners routinely insisted that Russia was a menace to its neighbours. As a result, a willingness to sacrifice the people for the good of the sovereign has been the common thread that run, that's run through Russian political life. This contention is perhaps the core of the black legend. Ivan the Terrible exemplified Muscovy. Peter the Great defined Imperial Russia. Stalin was the ultimate truth of the uh, Soviet Union and Putin was the only reality of post-Soviet Russia. They were all variations on the same principles and practices of total sovereign power. In these circumstances, opposition has been difficult. The archetypal opposition movement emerged in the 19th century. This was the intelligentsia. Frustrated by its stunted professional chances and angered by its exclusion from the political nation, it turned against the autocracy. Obsessed with German philosophy, it explained the world in abstracts that were a poor match for Russian conditions and had no organic connection to the reality of the people who lived there. Violent black and white radicalism resulted. It led naturally to the Bolshevik Revolution. Meanwhile, the characteristics of the Russian political tradition patrimonialism, corruption, the cult of a leader, repression, censorship, the absence of rights and civil society transmitted themselves across the revolutionary divides of 1917 and 1991. This is the black legend of Russian history. It is not a straw man, but a clever and coherent explanation. Not all of it is wrong. The relationship between ecology and society, for instance, contains important truths. Some of the legends have animated some of the legends insights have animated the best of historical writing. Taken whole and uncritically, however, it generates a dark reading of Russian society that has little explanatory power. Now, I would like to thank and acknowledge Mark Smith for his uh, fantastic book, The Russia Anxiety. Um, I guess it's not really normally my practice to read large sections from a book, but that is a particularly fantastic account, I guess, of this core idea. And uh, rather than try to 
recreate it myself, I thought I'd just uh, read from that text. So thanks very much, Mark Smith. And I guess there's just a few key ideas, both narrative ideas and also thematic ideas uh, that resonate with the current representation of Russia that uh, in, in the media, uh, particularly in the context of the war against Ukraine that uh, or the war in Ukraine that I just want to bring out a little bit. So in terms of the narrative story, and I'm going to get more to narrative Russian history a little bit more in a later episode of the Burning Archive, but it yeah, Mark Smith's account there, which is just a page or so, is relatively brief in presenting it, but there's a couple of key ideas that are common in the narrative. Uh, it's probably worth bringing out about to understand when you're hearing this black legend so that you can detach from it. So first of all, there's the idea that Russians were brutish medieval people who never really got out of the medieval times until, I don't know, the Russian Revolution, and in, in which their early history was dominated by uh, the Mongols and tyrants. In uh, the early part of the war against Ukraine, I think it might have even been the U US Embassy in Russia or Ukraine sent out a tweet which had a picture of uh, Kiev in, I don't know, 1000, something like that. I think there's a, an old church that was built in Kiev in around about 1000 AD and uh, a picture of an open field near Moscow and said, you know, because um, Moscow wasn't founded till about 1200 or so uh, and said, um, you know, civilization in Ukraine in the year 1000, civilization in Russia in the year 1000, and seemed to make the story uh, based on that. And this is really, I guess, a perpetuation of this idea of a brutish medieval people dominated by Mongols and tyrants. And I'm not going to sort of do the corrective of that now, but just to bring out how these sort of stories keep getting circulated. Uh, and then the second sort of narrative idea is that, uh, you know, from the 17th century, really, uh, Russia was this vast menacing empire that was built on serfdom, a decadent elite and autocracy, really still so into the 19th century. Of course, Russia did expand enormously into Siberia, down towards the Black Sea and all that sort of stuff through that time. And it had some extraordinary leaders, Catherine the Great, um, Peter the Great, um, uh, Alexander the uh, First and Nicholas the First or the Second, one of those two, um, who, who certainly had this uh, amazing empire. And it was a I guess a threat to the British and a threat to, to, to other European powers. So it was very much presented as a large, militarily dominant, but uh, poor and ignorant sort of society with an elite who really wanted to be part of the West and a lack of any real political system beyond autocracy. And again, perhaps you get similar ideas presented these days, the whole idea of Russia using resources as, as weapons against the civilized Europeans. Then the third idea is through the 19th century, the great revolt of the intelligentsia and the mystics. The revolt, revolt of the intelligentsia really li lays the ground for the early radical movements and uh, ultimately uh, Bolsheviks in the revolution and the mystics like Tolstoy and Dostoevsky uh, seek sort of spiritual redemption in the Russian soul given that the, uh, the character of Russian society is so so terrible and corrupted. So again, that is a bit of a narrative theme that you you hear uh, still. And then there is 
Also the story, the narrative idea that the Russian Revolution of 1917, or Russian Revolutions of 1917, the February and then the October Revolution, installed a new Tsar, that uh, yes, the old Tsar was overthrown, and briefly uh, Russia presented itself as the most democratic society in the world, but with the rise of Lenin and the Bolsheviks, a new Tsar, and that the old, this almost sort of, um, well, if you like, the black legend reasserted itself, and that the ghosts of dictators past, the ghost of Ivan the Terrible, the shadow of Ivan the Terrible, cast its shadow over Russian society again in the form of first Lenin and then Stalin. And then, more recently, and in more modern form, Vladimir Putin. And related to that story is that uh, a very important narrative theme in the Black Legend is that in the early 19th, oh, sorry, the late 19th and early 20th century, Russian society and Russian uh, legal and political institutions were not uh, mature enough and that they failed to provide institutions of democracy that uh, liberalism failed in Russia and succumbed to extreme conservatism or extreme radicalism that parliamentarianism never really took hold in Russia and uh, that that if you like Russia has never really experienced a democratic society they don't know how to run a democracy over there so the account might go so again that is one of the narrative uh, themes of the black legend of Russian history and then I guess the last narrative theme of the black legend of Russian history really relates to uh, the hope of the 1990s, at least amongst Americans, that yes, com uh, communism, socialism uh, was overthrown in Russia, the Soviet Union collapsed, new nations like Ukraine were formed uh, out of the um, collapsing superstructure of the old Soviet Empire, and uh, Russia had a chance to join the West. They were able to have McDonald's in Moscow, uh, you know, dance to rock music and all the rest of it. But the black legend would have it. Vladimir Putin betrayed the West. Russia's, uh, the hope of Russia becoming like America was betrayed in the late 1990s, early 2000s by Vladimir Putin's turn to the old black legend of Russian uh, habit of dark authoritarianism. Now all those uh, are common sort of narrative themes that you'll hear in uh, presentations in the media about Russian history and they are all, they all spring out of some real facts but they are also all very serious distortions. Distortions that tend to have these common themes of dictatorship, totalitarianism, authoritarianism, personified in the character of Putin, Stalin, Ivan the Terrible, um, and the lesser known but um, dominant czars of 19th century Russia. Person uh, the, the, the theme that the sort of corruption of Russian society represented by corruption itself, oligarchs and Russian underground mafia criminals, the dominance of espionage and military aggression and spies in Russian history, and the suppression of true intellectual life in uh, in Russian history uh, in a, in with a decadent elite corrupt to its core pleasure pleasure seeking aristocrats with a brutish unsophisticated population beneath it
they are the sort of themes over and over that you'll see presented in films and all the rest of it. And also there is this theme of banging on Europe's gate, that that Russia is not part of Europe, that Russia is uh, external to Europe, to Western Europe, and yet uh, Russia is deeply envious of Europe uh, and that it is banging, demanding ad admission, demanding control over Europe at its gate. Indeed, so often that at times you'll see today Ukraine described as Europe's gate. How exactly you can <laughs> describe one part of the great Euro-Caspian steppe as a gate I don't quite know, but um, nonetheless, people do that. So again, this this theme that Russia is not really part of Europe, although parts of Russian heritage will be claimed at times for Europe. Think Tolstoy, think Dostoevsky, think Tchaikovsky. But it's envious and aggressive towards Europe and Europe has to defend itself and close its doors to the Russian bear. All of that drives, as Mark Smith says, this cycle of fear, contempt and disregard for Russia that ultimately underpins terrible, terrible misunderstandings and terrible uh, failures of diplomacy, failures of policy, so that this poor understanding of history or this, um, this satisfying set of myths about history that comfort the West in its superiority and uh, engage in a bit of, well, what otherwise would be described as casual racism, except a, a kind of a cultural superiority complex over Russians, is, uh, leads to terrible, terrible uh, mistakes uh, from our governments. So anyhow, that's the black legend of Russian history. Like the black legend of Spanish history, like most black legends, it is a legend and not the facts and it's important to try to overcome it as Mark B. Smith says with a little bit of a dose of history a few lessons of history and importantly by trying to see history as a more layered complex cake a complex a complex set of layers all melding into each other rather than one simple a uh, simplistic story and I think uh, for our own thinking about present times it is helpful to recognize some of these tropes um, of the black legend of Russian history and how they replayed in so much of the news stories we'll see about Russia in the presentations of Russia and Russians in movies and in the policy decisions even of our governments. So, but by recognizing that uh, and by correcting the black legend with a different narrative of Russian history, we can perhaps come to a better understanding of what Russia is really like today, how complex and sophisticated and different Russia really is today, and we can perhaps learn to live better with this nation of uh, whatever it is, 160 million people that occupies one sixth of the landmass of the world. We can learn to live better with this country in a multipolar world. So in the next episode of the Burning Archive, I am actually going to turn to retelling some of the key dimensions of Russian history, potentially over a few episodes, uh, uh, and follow broadly Mark P. Smith's corrective narrative to the Russian black legend. So that will be uh, next time. Until then, 
do share the Burning Archive podcast with your friends and leave us a five-star review on Apple iTunes. Um, spread the word about uh, the podcast so that more people can insulate themselves against the disinformation of the Russian black legend. And rather than my usual sign out uh, this week, I am actually recording and uh, editing this show on the day the news came through that Mikhail Gorbachev, former and last president of the Soviet Union, uh, died at the age of 91 in Moscow overnight. And so uh, I think I will probably do a special episode on Mikhail Gorbachev, which will in fact serve as a good introduction to a corrective retelling of Russian history. But in the meantime, in addition to um, remembering that what thou lovest well will not be reft from thee, let's uh pay our respects to Mikhail Gorbachev who brought Glasnost or open public discussion to the Soviet Union uh, even at the cost of the disintegration of the Soviet Union and uh, who will surely be remembered as amongst the most significant uh, leaders of the 20th century and uh, how better to farewell uh, Mikhail Gorbachev than the song of the Volga boatman sung by Leonid Karitinov and the Red Army Choir in the Moscow Tchaikovsky Hall in 1965. Remember what the love as well will not be left from thee. <laughs> Oh, <laughs> 